Okay, so. All right. So thank you so much uh, for coming to our project management 101. And this is really just, you know, an essentials, fundamentals of project management. And we're just going to talk briefly about some tools, techniques, and terminology. So I'm going to go ahead and put a link in the chat. And this takes you to a Notion page. And on that Notion page, we have um, an awesome just guide PDF for, you know, after you leave this webinar and you're thinking, what did she say? And that definitely talks about what we go over and it has terminology and images and anything that can really um, remind your brain what you learned today. Also, we have a project charter template and a project postmortem that I'm going to talk about more throughout our presentation. So just a little bit about me. I um, am a former middle school teacher turned training and development specialist. I made a pivot and I've been with Neil ever since I uh, pivoted to that. And I also have a love of project management because not only was I a teacher, which you manage things all the time, but I'm also a mother of three. And that can be in of itself of management, the house, the doctor's appointments, the birthday parties. Oh my goodness. So many birthday parties right now. So, um, I see some people joining. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I have put a link in the chat that gives you access to um, the Notion page for this webinar. And it has a PDF guide. It has um, and some templates that we're going to look at. OK, so if you ever have any questions, feel free to email at help at nactraining.com. An actual human being will be there to respond to you with our vast amounts of knowledge. Now, today, I would like us to go over just some project management basics, knowledge management areas, project management phases, because they are the same in no matter what type of methodology you use, they are the same in all projects. And then some project management tools that you probably already have at your disposal, and I'm going to show you how you can utilize those. Feel free if you have any question while I am talking to put that in the chat. Um, my lovely training producers on here and they will let me know if I have any questions, if I don't see it pop up. All right, so first we want to define the structure of traditional project management cycle. So that's like I said, it goes for all projects across the world. They follow the same five phases to be a successful project. Then we're going to review um, two very popular methodologies that are utilized in project management, which are waterfall and agile. And lastly, we're going to end the hour just talking about some popular work management tools and software, really with a basis on looking at Microsoft applications that you may already utilize and some other areas on the internet that are great for task management, and all of the great things that go with project management. All right, I'm ready. I hope you're ready. Let's get this going on this Friday afternoon. So some of y'all may uh, have been project managers for a while. You may be looking into that, thinking that's an area. Um, I was speaking with some of y'all earlier and you were just talking about how you know your job sometimes goes into that lane. And just knowing some basic terminology would be really helpful for you. So I'm just going to go over a few terms that are uh, across the board for types of project management. And that first one is scope. So scope is your work that has to be performed to deliver your product, your service, or your specified features and functions. And there's a whole lot that goes into your project scope. You have to think about your budget. How much money do you have? Is it flexible at all? Your schedule, same thing. How much time do you have? Is it flexible at all? And 
when we look at some of those, you know, some are more fixed than others when we follow different methodologies. Stakeholders. How often are you going to meet with your stakeholders? What do they really want from this project? What resources do you have? Do you need to meet with your project sponsor to see how many people, how many um, subject, subject matter experts you need to bring in for this? Do you already have all of the people on your team that are needed for this? Your goals, and we'll talk more about how you can formulate goals here in a little bit. And then the actual whole purpose of the project, which is the deliverable. How is it getting done? How long do we need, you know, version one? Can we have, um, you know, what is our minimal vi viable product that we can get out? Another common terminology is the triad of constraints or the project management triangle or the triangle of constraints. So like I said, across all different types of projects, these are the three constraints within a project. Your time, meaning your timeline that you have for this project, your budget, and your scope. Waterfall does it a little bit differently than Agile. Uh, waterfall looks like this triangle and in actuality, Agile flips it upside down. And there, that really focuses on what is fixed and what is flexible within your project. Then we have our 10 knowledge areas. Yes, 10, that's a lot, absolutely. I could do an entire webinar probably on just one knowledge management area. But these are the specific areas that need to be managed within a project. Integration, scope, I, heard, I told you, you're gonna hear that word so many times. Time, cost, quality. If you're making a project for your stakeholder and it is not what they are asking for, then it's gonna be really difficult to deliver them a quality product and to meet, be successful. Human resources, that may not be an area that you really think about when you think of project management, but they have to be conferred and discussed. Communication, uh, that's one of the largest things in project management is being consistent with your communication. Risk, looking at risk management, risk mitigation, procurement, and then obviously your stakeholders. I've seen some people come in. Thank you so much for joining us today. You'll find in the chat a link that takes you to the Notion page that uses our PDF for this webinar and some of our templates that are created to help you on your project management journey. Okie dokie. Next word to know is dependency, not your loving children on your taxes, although they do depend on a task to be completed. So if we're looking at this image here, this is a Miro board. It is a wonderful tool to use with project management. We can see that we, this is in an agile perspective. We can see that we have a nice little color code over here. The tasks are green, the yellow are milestone or events, red salmon colored is a significant dependency, and then our white is our features or an enablers. So if we look down here, we have team A and they have two tasks, but notice they can't even start their tasks until team B does these two tasks, which are labeled as dependencies. So within this agile mindset, which is a methodology for project management, you have a cross-functional team and there could be pieces of teams working on different areas, but they can still be dependent. And it can become even more complex if you're doing a safe, agile mindset. So they would need to complete this first and you can see that they're all going to this feature of user authentication. And then lastly, this is an inputs, tools, and techniques and outputs framework. So this helps you understand the connections between all of the resources and information and plans used to create and implement a project plan. 
And as we go throughout this webinar today, I'll tell you at what portion in the project uh, management lifecycle phase we're in, where we're at on this framework. Input, project charter, project management plan, project documents, accepted deliverables, tools and techniques. Those are your people, your experts, your SHMEs, uh, data analysis, and then meetings. And then outputs have to do with project document updates, accepted deliverables, postmortems, and retrospectives. All right, so we got through all of that lingo that we may not know. And remember, those are all in that PDF guide that you have access to. So you're probably thinking, okay, so like I said, some of y'all are in project management. Some of y'all have been voluntold to do some project manage, project manager duties. So what is project management? Well, project management is the application, the proficient application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques in a systematic and hopefully strategic manner where you need to plan and execute and monitor and you're assuring the attainment of specific goals and objectives to complete a successful project. Now, in my other life, where I was a middle school teacher, I love statistics. I mean, there's always the joke that what, 75% of statistics are made up? Well, these statistics are not, I found these. And they talk about why it's so important for project management to actually be in place at your company. So 32% of projects fail due to poor management. I'm sure we have all sat in and been a part of different areas in our lives where you can tell that no one had any clue what was happening and it starts to fall through. Now, there's always some person that tries to get in there and tries to, you know, pick up the pieces and make it work. Those people would be awesome project managers. But that is a very low percentage and that is uh, not great. Next, we have 68% of projects fail to meet deadlines, budgets, or goals. Well, if you think back to us talking about what scope was and the triad of constraints, <laughs> Chris, that's funny. Abe Lincoln said 82% of internet stats are inaccurate. Absolutely. My middle schoolers actually thought I was alive when Abe Lincoln was. Yeah. We, we drew a timeline after that to really get the, uh, the full effect. If they're not meeting those triads of constraints, then obviously they're going to fail. And then you will not have a successful project. But on the flip side... 97% of businesses recognize that project management is essential. They know it is essential. They know that it's needed. And when it is in place and your team knows uh, what you need to do and if it's taught to them correctly, then it runs like a well-oiled machine. Um, as someone who is married to someone in IT, I found this one quite um Surprising that 45% of large IT projects run over budget on average. My husband was not surprised at all <laughs> since he has been uh, part of quite a few of them. But these statistics show us why project management is important. And you can just, you can start it. You can, you know, listen to this and you can read. There's so much information and there are so many opportunities to learn about this and then you can make it your own way and see how it fits you best. So we talked about what it is and why it is. Let's now talk about who a project manager is. So um, we have our team here, Project Discovery. They're all assembled. We've got our project coordinator and then we have um, our team, our QA specialists. Let's meet Candace. She's very happy. She does love her job. So Candace is a great project manager because she has a lot of these skills that go with project managers, being she's organized. She's goal-oriented. A huge part of project management is goals. 
So knowing where you're going and keeping your team on track is one of the hardest parts of being a project manager, um, especially if you go the route of a scrum master, which is in that scrum agile that we were, we're going to talk about in a little bit. She's also passionate about the process. This can be something where people do not want to change and people do not want to do what's asked. So you have to be passionate and understand why these things are being done so that you can explain those to people on your team. This needs to be done this way because this is how it's going to affect us in the long run. Giving people hard facts, maybe some visuals, always helpful. Also, she works well under pressure. That part, you know, where you have to like go and talk to people and remind them to get on task and do things that they may not want to do. She can provide leadership, she can listen, she can go um, for bat for her team and talk to the organization or the stakeholders. <clears throat> Those are all things that she is great at. And then she has soft skills. You have to be able to, you have to like, <laughs> you have to like other people to be a good project manager, I feel, because we are all humans. Um, Carol and I were talking before we got started, you know, about AI and how it's starting to take over certain areas. And like, we are still human. We still have tons of things happening in our lives. And so being able to listen and to talk to them and stay on task is a very hard road to walk, but as a project manager, you can definitely do it. And all of this is going to lead to having a successful project because she's knowledgeable. She knows what she needs to do when she needs to do it. Okay. So we talked about what it is, why it's important and who. So now let's move into our key project management concepts. This is this is where we're going to get about, you know, what is a project? What's considered a project? And you might think, I know what this is, but there are specifics in the realm of project management. A project is temporary. This is not something that happens every day. This is not everyday tasks, everyday work. This is something that's temporary. It's unique. It's You don't already have this at your company. You are creating something new, a new deliverable. You might be making a, pot, a past version better, but it's unique at this time. You have specific goals, okay? Projects are undertaken to achieve a specific goal or an objective. And then you have the allocated resources. And we'll talk about that here when we talk about our project charter, but you have to have um, resources, including personnel, budget, materials to achieve your objectives. Resource allocation is a key aspect of project management. So to get a better understanding what a project is compared to everyday operations. So a project would be something like a software development project to create a new mobile app. That is the project. The day-to-day -day operation would be maintaining the infrastructure to support that mobile app. Once that mobile app has been created, your business is going to have to then supply the support for it. Your IT team is going to have to know and QA test and look at different versions and bugs and all of that. Another example of a great project would be organizing a marketing campaign for a new product launch. Once that project has been completed, then you still have the everyday operations of managing the product's supply chain. We've created this new product. We have to get it to the store so that we can have people buy it and we can make some money. Our last project would be uh, leading a construction project to build a new office building. Once the building is built, the construction members are not going to stick around. I mean, one might be like, hey, look at this building outside. I built it. Maybe, maybe one, but they're not all going to stay around. So then it falls into the daily operation of running the building services, the janitors, the cafeteria, um, all of the different, the mailroom, all the things that go into what happens after the project has been completed. 
So we discussed the triad of constraints previously, and let's dig deeper, deeper into the three parts. Time is the amount of time it takes to perform the project. Scope is the amount of work to be performed and the deliverables to be provided. And then cost is the amount of money it takes to perform the work. You, can, you can't adjust one without affecting one or both of the other two. They are all together. And let's be real, if you go over budget or you don't deliver on time, is it gonna matter if you met your scope? Probably not. And what the shareholders wanted. So um, I told you that there were the 10 knowledge management areas. Um, and we go more in depth in these in our longer project management series. But today we're just going to focus on the three very important areas, which are integration, time, and communication. I'm just going to give you a minute to look at all those because you, it's just so much that goes into it. And a project manager isn't supposed to know how to do all of it, but they need to have at least a basis knowledge on who they need to help, ask for help. And they need to know what is needed from these people as they work together in this company to make this project a success. Okay, integration. So project integration management plays a critical role in orchestrating project activities, processes, and the stakeholders. It aligns all of the management areas towards a common goal. Goal is that word that keeps popping up as well. Uh, for example, if you're behind schedule on a project, you can either go over budget or finish the project late, uh, which brings us back to that triad of constraints. Assessing these situations and making decisions around them is a key part of project integration. Why is it beneficial though? Why do you want to really understand this? Because this project integration management facilitates the coordination of all of the different project components, ensuring that all of the team members adhere to a single comprehensive plan and then in turn, it maintains project efficiency and smooth workflow. Once again, you've probably been working with people before where you were not all on the same plan and you were not exactly sure what you're supposed to be doing. And in the long run, that just creates more work and a headache sometimes. So work smarter, not harder, right? All right, our next one is time. Most projects uh, involve various timelines and people's schedules. Some team members may be cautious by overestimating time and others might be overly optimistic. Unexpected issues can disrupt your plans. Effective time management is crucial because it helps you adjust tasks, allocate resources, and maintain control when challenges arise. Hmm, so let's think, what could be a challenge? Vacation, that's not a challenge in my mind. Like, Yes, go do that. That's amazing. I love me some, some beach time, right? Sickness, okay? You're sick. Your children are sick. I mentioned earlier, I have three children. Sickness happens. Um, someone leaves the company. Someone retires, okay? Uh, I don't know, COVID, a pandemic. That would definitely be a disruption in our timeline, so all of these are challenges that your project manager needs to be able to navigate. So why is time management beneficial? Because it ensures your project stays on track with the original deadlines and schedules. And this allows for smoother and a more timely project completion. All right, the last management area we're gonna talk about today is communication. How often have you encountered the request? Just, just keep me in the loop, keep me informed. However, even with this request, essential stakeholders might sometimes be excluded when changes occur. So balancing communication is vital. A well-structured communication management plan is essential for determining who should receive information and when, especially before your project commences. 
when I was a teacher, I would send out a weekly email to parents because especially middle schoolers, they don't give you much information at all. <laughs> but um, just knowing what was the, the big information that was needed and where we were going is always very helpful. The key to communication is consistency. Whether you're communicating with your team or your stakeholders or your organization. So you could send a weekly update to management to provide statuses of your project. If you follow the Scrum or Agile methodology, you would communicate in your daily standups or sprint reviews. Uh, of course, there are many different tools to help with this um, from chat to file sharing or good old fashioned email. So it's beneficial because effective communication is crucial on significant projects to ensure all the parties are appropriately notified of changes, developments, and challenges. Inadequate communication can lead to issues, making it a crucial aspect to maintain strength in your project. So like I said, uh, I could do an entire webinar on all of those management areas, and we do go more in depth in our project management uh, class. Okay, so let's pivot to management methodologies. All right, waterfall versus agile. Tale as old as time. No, that's being a piece. No, so these are the two most common project management methodologies. And you may have heard of SAFE, uh, Kanban, Scrum, um, Lean Sigma Six, those are all different types of methodologies that typically use Agile as the framework. When we think of that triad of constraints, we can go back and think waterfall, its scope is fixed and its cost is fixed, but their schedules can change a bit. And that's when I said Agile kind of flips it upside down. So the cost and schedules are fixed. Your your budget, your it you know your um, sprints, but your scope is variable. You that's the whole point of agile is it changes as you go. Not within a sprint, you're not allowed to change things within a sprint. But as you move throughout your um, MVP, you can change things. <laughs> so Carol's saying, uh, what is the most common communication platform use? Uh, I would say Teams. I would say Teams is great because you can share files in there. You could have a um, team that has the different channels where you could put announcements so people could just read it there instead of having to put it in an email. And then it has access to you know your files to your SharePoint site. Or you can even put planner in a team and they'll have access to their tasks, which Microsoft is coming out with a new planner. And I'm so excited to play around with it. Definitely do some videos on that. So I would say using teams, if you guys use teams right now, Carol at your company, but yes, check it, check your email. I have definitely sent those before, or you want to say, if you'd read your email, but then you go, nope, delete, and you type it again. All right. So the waterfall methodology is that traditional methodology. It is a linear step-by-step -step approach, and it's ideal for projects that have a clear scope and a predictable timeline. Um, infrastructure projects, like building a bridge, the constraints are clear. You have to uh, do a lot of rigorous planning up front to ensure that the project stays on track. So you've got your, you're going to build a bridge. You have to find the area to do that. You have to find the materials. You have to get permits. Uh, you're definitely going to have drawings of that, probably multiple versions of drawings of that. It's a bridge. You, you want it to cover area where people can walk on it or drive across it, right? That's a bridge. That's what it's purpose for. Or maybe it goes up and down. Yes, Chris, that's a great uh, point. 
He's saying that waterfall is also beneficial when you have a limited staff or time and have to manage a larger process in smaller phases. Absolutely. Great points. Um, so it's really effective and it's for straightforward projects that require minimal adaptation. Um, and it might not be suitable for more complex initiatives that demand more of a flexible dynamic approach. So when would you use waterfall? It's, it's a serious debate. Um, typically, like I said, when it's has that linear approach to it, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more in example, but the development is sequential and it's delivered stage by stage. Quality, the extensive testing is typically done at the end. And then you have feedback, we're at the end of deployment and then your teamwork is moderate. And that is different than an agile. But like Chris was saying, if you have limited staff and time, a great way to do it. So um, I am very much a visual person. That is how I learn. And when I think of waterfall, it makes me think of when we built our house. A daunting task because I always said to my husband, I would never build a house with him because we cannot agree on things, <laughs> except that we love each other, right? So, but when you're building a house, it's sequential. You can't put the roof on before the walls are up. So the first is requirement. That's the phase where you identify and document your dream house requirements. I'm on Pinterest, I'm looking in magazines, I'm looking in all these different places and I'm like, this is the house I want. The number of rooms, the style, uh, what do, do I want brick? What do I want on the outside is, do I want a home theater? Do I want a swimming pool? I definitely want a swimming pool. Um, and my preferred materials. And then I think about my budget and ask other stakeholders, my family, what they want. And once that's all decided, we have the design phase. So we do the floor plans and the elevations and the you know detailed specifications for materials and finishes. And if you've ever built a house and they're like, this is the free stuff. And then you're like, show me the other things, please, because I do not want that carpet. <laughs> it's reminiscent of like cruise ship carpet where you're just like, this is, this, this is not, no, thank you. Nothing against cruise ship carpets. They're very similar to classroom carpets too, I feel. Then we move into implementation, um, which is the construction phase. And we process through the construction phase. I lived very close to where my house was being built. So I stocked it on the daily, which was thrilling. Um, and also like, wow, they did a lot in one day. Then we have testing. So you conduct inspections uh, at various stages of construction to ensure quality. Um, and then we have deployment. So this is, you know, construction is complete. You have your final walkthrough. Um, you have them fix anything and you get your keys. And then you're at maintenance and boy, is there maintenance with house because, you know, you move in, that's the fun part. Actually moving is not the fun part, but you know what I'm saying? You become a homeowner. But then your AC starts making noises and a freeze is coming and you have to cover your pipes. That's all maintenance within your house. So it's linear, it's sequential. You have to do it in stages. Uh, and then it's testing done at the end. So that is a waterfall example in layman's terms. Then we have agile. And agile is my favorite. I do have... I do like it. And it's because it has continuous development over multiple cycles. Those are also called sprints. And it really encourages teams to work simultaneously on different phases of the project. And it also has frequent stakeholder engagement. You meet with them far more than you do with Waterfall. And it's just really highly flexible. So you have a backlog over here and within a agile, if you're following using a scrum framework, uh, you have a product owner who's in charge of the backlog. 
and they decide to bring some things in for the sprint. Sprints usually last between two to four weeks. And the teams meet daily. It's called a daily stand-up. They're supposed to last about 15 minutes. That's why they're called daily stand-ups. So you wouldn't have to sit down. I did see one where it was a joke that everyone was planking so that the daily stand-up wouldn't last very long. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to plank for 15 minutes. Uh, put me down for a minute, please. <laughs> so uh, you have your sprint and you have your different things that need to be done within that sprint and your development team helps create those user stories and analyzes them, defines them, de designs them, and tests them within that sprint. So with Waterfall, they're testing at the very end of that stage. And in uh, Agile, they're testing continuously within that sprint. And then they deploy. And it really works best when the customer is involved in all phases. This is what we have. Is this what you want? Yes, great. And they go back and they continue. And at the end of Waterfall, you might have, you know, one version after a year. And with Agile, maybe after three months, you have this MVP, your minimum viable product or most valuable player. Carol was talking about March Madness happening right now. But in Agile, it's minimum viable product. So you might, after three months, have this version and then in another month, three months, you might have two, you know, version two. So it's just continuously improving your product. Some great case studies for Agile would be Google and Spotify. I mean, Google started in 1996. I always love to tell my kids that I've been around longer than the internet. And you're not getting that same research project from 1996. They've evolved, okay? They've used iterative development to continually meeting what their the demands are of their customers. Same with Spotify. Uh, Spotify was a simple streaming platform and now it offers a whole lot more. It offers podcasts, uh, playlists, you're going on a road trip, Spotify is there for you. And that too was developed with the adapt adaptability, talking too fast for myself, of Agile. So, you pick whichever one best fits your team. That is all I'm saying here. I'm just giving you options and you know just a basis for them. I have another um, series on Agile and Scrum that goes more in depth with those. But um, so Waterfall has a clear roadmap to project completion, while Agile has that clear roadmap through the minimum viable product. In Waterfall, the project manager holds authority over the project. There is no project manager in Scrum. There is one sometimes if you're using safe agile. There's a Scrum master, which is kind of like the team champion. It's they're there to listen. They're there to reduce impediments or blockers for their team. But the great thing about agile is they're self-organizing and they're cross-functional. So they can bring in different subject matter experts to work on a certain portion of that sprint. Uh, waterfall, you can really only do changes at the start of the project. Like they can't build my bathroom and then maybe like, no, 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 no. I wanted this after it's all built out. They're gonna be like, no ma'am, you have to find somebody else to do that. We can't do that for you. With Agile, they can pivot quickly between sprints. They actually have a saying where it says to fail fast. If you're going to fail, you might as well do it quickly so that you can learn from it and continue on. Stakeholder meetings are at progress port points. And with Agile, they're frequent meetings with stakeholders at the end of sprints. You can do a sprint review with your stakeholders where you go through what you've completed, where you're going, what's going to come out of the backlog next. So like I said, very surface level of waterfall versus agile. I do, I just kind of think it's a winner, but that is my um, area of expertise. I am a scrum master and product owner by trade. So, all right, let's get into these five phases of project management. And I said that these are the same across all projects. These have to be completed 
at the start, and then you move into your methodology of waterfall or agile or scrum or Kanban or others. And some people use Scrum Bond. They take different pieces from it and make it their own. And that's, there's, there is no project management place out there. You can do what you need to do. So our five phases are initiation, planning, executing, monitoring, and closing. And we're gonna dig deeper into each of these phases. So initiation is phase one. So they have these stakeholders come to your team and they're like, we have this idea. And if you know those people who are idea people, I'm one of those people too. They have these lofty ideas where they're like, this is what's going to happen. And then the team's like, okay, that's a, that's a great idea. I think it's awesome. But let's, you know, actually look at this more closely and figure out what exactly you want from this. So they have to define a project goal. And most people use the SMART process to create goals. So you have a goal in mind and you look at your specifics. Who is going to do this? What are they going to do? When are we going to do it? And why and which, right? Those are your specifics. And then you have your measurables, your metrics, your milestones. Is there how much how can we find a percentage to see if you know this is improving or not? What needs to be done by a certain time? And then we have uh, achievable. Is this currently achievable? Do we do, do we have the people and the skills at this moment to accomplish this, or do we need to bring people in, consultants, other people from other departments? And then relevant. Does it fit? with your overall organizational objectives at this time. And then it's time bound. That takes us all the way back to when we talked about projects. Okay, it has to be intermediate and it has a deadline. Okay, it's temporary. So once these goals have been accomplished, you're going to then have your uh, project charter, which on that Notion page, we have a project charter right here template. So I'm gonna go ahead and open it. And you just put your project manager, project name, sponsor if you have one, start date, end date, cost and savings. And then you look at this and you say, what's the purpose of this project? You've defined these goals, place them there. What are the outcomes of this project? Scope, we talked about that. What needs to be done to actually complete this and give this product to the stakeholders? The deliverables, what is the product going to be? Um, an estimated schedule, because we know time changes all the time. Who's working on this? Who are any key stakeholders? Risks, risk analysis, any assumptions, constraints, or dependencies that depend on this project that it relies on? And what meets the su success criteria? Um, in Agile, it's called the definition of done, where everybody agrees that if it looks like this, it is quality, it is done, it is completed. And then you have your sponsor and manager sign this. And this is the thing that needs to be completed before you have your kickoff meeting and all of those other things that fall in line with a great project. And if you join a project, this is probably the first thing you should ask. Can I see your project charter? And if they look at you like, what now? Then you're like, run. No, don't run. Just ask for it. So I mentioned stakeholders. Internal stakeholders are the CEO and your HR team and the members of the team that are working on the project. And then you have your external stakeholders, which is really anyone that has interest in your project outcomes. So eventually the user who's going to use this interface or product or deliverable, um, customers as well. If you've got contractors working, suppliers, Sometimes you have government entities that you're working with. Those are all your external stakeholders, the people that you are creating this product for, 
uh, they're going to be affected by your project at any point in its cycle. And uh, their input can directly impact the outcome. Oh, there's Candace. Can't forget our project manager as being a part of the internal stakeholder. All right, phase two is planning. So during this phase, um, your team should really prioritize the project and calculate a budget and schedule and determine what your resources are needed by creating a project management plan. The project plan functions as the like operating manual uh, to carry out the project to completion. And once the stakeholders approve the project charter, the project manager creates this project management plan uh, using the objective and scope from the charter. Then you're going to define the project scope, which is the work that needs to be done. And you need to be on the lookout for scope creep. And scope creep are things that are not in your scope. Like this is what needs to be done. And here comes scope creep. Beep, 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 beep. Get out. We don't want you. That is when things that are not a part of our scope that we have already written goals for and we have already laid out budgets and timelines for, they tried to come and interfere from another team member, from somebody trying to put in their own input, or it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So scope creep is something that definitely happens. The project manager should be on the lookout for that and should be able to get their team back on track and stay on task. Okie dokie. Then we can create a work breakdown structure or a WBS. So this can be done in so many different ways and there's so many different forms of uh, software that can help you with this. And this is essentially making those tasks, who, who is going to do it, what task is it, and the, it comes out of the backlog or it comes off of the project, what needs to be done, what needs to be done first, are there any dependencies on that? So you're obviously gonna wanna get those done before the others. So in our ITTO, we are currently in the input part of the framework. Project charter, project management plan, project documents, document, 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 right? Keep it all going. Phase three is executing. So task management, this is where your team rolls up their sleeves and they get to work and they're completing their tasks. Uh, this is a JIRA board showing a sprint. Uh, you can see that these are still to do. They've been assigned to someone. These are in progress. Uh, resource allocation, we talked about that briefly. Um, when this happens, they are assigning and distributing resources to personnel and projects and activities within the organization. And then quality control is used heavily during this phase. Quality control is the process of ensuring that the deliverables of a project meet predefined quality standards and that the work is error-free and fit for its intended purpose. Phase four has metrics and KPIs. This is a uh, Monday board, monday.com board, which does everything I feel like. But you can see that they can adjust their schedules or whatever is necessary to keep the project on track by looking at their metrics and their key performance indicators, looking at the different members of their team. This is obviously one way you can look at it. And then we have progress reporting and communication, which takes us back to that communication key, keeping everyone in the loop, weekly emails, also including your stakeholders in that, letting them just know where you're at and what you see coming next. And issue and risk management, you can try your best to figure out what could happen but things will still happen. So having a plan in place, being prepared to fix those things or going to the right people is always helpful. All right, so we are currently in our tools and technique, technique part of our ITTO. And then probably the most overlooked phase, which is the closing phase. How many of y'all have been on projects that were done and you still get emails? I mean, I've been out of teaching and I sometimes still get text messages asking me questions. 
So uh, you receive the customer acceptance and they sign off. They say, yes, this is what we wanted. You've given it over to them, to the stakeholders for what they wanted. And then you should really have a post-mortem or a lessons learned afterwards. And you can use that post-mortem template that we have in that link right here. And it really just goes over, um, you know, and discusses all the things that happened within the project. It's just a great way to celebrate. Your team took an abstract idea and created this deliverable from it. So take the time, celebrate your team, and learn from mistakes so that you can make your next project even more successful. All right, we are running out of time, but I am going to get into these tools so that you know what's out there for you. This is obviously the output version in the ITTO. All right, so popular project management applications. We've got Microsoft Project. It is very large, okay? And it's very comprehensible. So if you are new to project management, that is not the rate I would go for you, okay? Microsoft Planner, I did tell you it's getting some updates. Yes, I'm excited, but it's very lightweight. Okay, it is, it's, it's more customizable with the new um, version coming out, but it's still a lightweight task management tool. It does come free with your M365 though. Jira, Jira is a highly specialized application for software management and agile. Um, here's a Jira board. This is a sprint board. You can see there's four days remaining. You might be getting over here and being like, oh, we need to get some stuff done because if we haven't done this yet and these are still in progress, we might need to split up some work among other team members as well. Then we have um, Asana, Smartsheet, and Monday.com. All of these can really do what you need them to do. You just have to find one that A works best for your team, is easy for them to use, fits your budget. Asana is great for all team sizes. Smartsheet has that Excel functionality. And then Monday is highly customizable. I feel like I could ask Monday to make me a grilled cheese and it'd be like, I'll be right there. It's very customizable. So looking at these, Jira, Asana, and Microsoft Planner have free plans. Like I said, Planner is included with your 365. Project, Monday.com, and Smartsheet do not include free plans. On a customization level, Jira, Monday, Project, and Asana are highly customizable. Smartsheet's kind of there in the middle. And like I said, Planner is very low customized, but it does have some new things coming out. And if you're going to go the Agile route, Jira, Monday, Planner, and Asana are great for that. They have lots of boards that can help you look and put buckets and do different things, um, do different cards, if that's the avenue you want to go. Or Waterfall, Smartsheet, Microsoft Project, they use lots of Gantt charts too, that sometimes we like to see that with that Waterfall timeline. Here's my bang for your buck scale, okay? Smallest cost to the largest cost, Planner here, Asana, Jira, Monday, Smartsheet, Project. So those have that free basic plan. Planner comes with your Microsoft 365. Asana has a basic free plan, or it can be $10.99 per user per month. Jira uh, has a cloud, so it's, it's stored in the cloud for $5 per user per month. And then you could put Jira on your own company server for $10 per user per month. Monday has an $8 basic and a $10 standard. Smartsheet has an individual price of $14 and business price of $25. And then project just has a 
standalone $30 per user per month. So that's why I say go with one of these if that fits your company's need. For management tools of integration, Asana is great, Smartsheet, and Project. For looking at time, Jira and Monday are great at task management and keeping you in time. Microsoft Planner Project is great for communication. And like I said, you could put both of those into a Teams, uh, into a, a Microsoft Teams team or a channel. So um, this is kind of coming out of the project management essentials right here. And we go more in depth in the class. We also have an Agile and Scrum project management that looks at Agile, Scrum, scenarios, and the best tools. And then using Microsoft applications for project management. Oh, I got a little happy there. But um, we have reached our time. I would love to stay on and answer any questions that you have. And if not, I hope you have learned something today. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend and a great rest of your Friday. All right, any questions? Awesome, that's great, Carol. Enjoy the rest of your Friday and your March Madness. <laughs> nice, go Badgers. Um, was I talking so fast at the end? Yes, I was.